As Justice League issue 17 opens, we see a single shot of the Amnesty Bay lighthouse from the water. The raging seas crash against the shore, flinging spray upwards. Multiple streaks of lightning crawl across the sky, and thunder crashes. Rain pounds on the lighthouse, but its golden light cuts through the dark night sky. Arthur narrates, His father, Tom Curry, used to spend entire nights mourning boats away from the shore. Sometimes, Arthur would sneak out of bed and stay up with him, just watching his dad work. One time, Tom caught Arthur on a night when the storm was particularly bad. His dad seemed scared. After some time, Tom admitted to his son, I'm scared that they're coming for you, Arthur. Arthur had never been more terrified in his life. But his father isn't here anymore. There's no one giving warnings anymore. It's too late for that. On the Justice League's watchtower, the team has returned. Arthur helps Dr. Shin up, his face bruised and swollen from where Volko backhanded him. He reports Volko's betrayal, that he sabotaged the U.S.'s USS Mabus and attacked Atlantis. He is the one who started this war. But he's not here anymore. Cyborg reports that he used the teleporter, but its history has been wiped. He could be anywhere in the world right now. Superman asks, why would Aquaman's friend do this? Mera guesses that he wants revenge for being exiled, although she adds that she might be projecting. Superman looks at her. Why, what did they do to you? Eh, it's what they did to her ancestors, she reports. A news report cuts in, saying that the monsters are coming out of the water. Aquaman explains that Volko is using the Dead King Scepter in order to control the creatures of the Trench, and he's targeting Atlantis's forces. As he watches the news report, Arthur can only say that this is all his fault. Batman and Wonder Woman disagree. He didn't launch this attack. He didn't drown hundreds of people. But Arthur is adamant. He is the one who left Atlantis in the hands of Orm, knowing full well how he felt about the surface world. He knew what Orm would do if it ever came to war. And this is the result. Atlantis is his responsibility. The war isn't, Batman says. It's the responsibility of all of them. This is why the Justice League exists. Down in Boston, it really is war. The rookie super forces are all cut up, battling the forces of Atlantis. Flood waters wash over the streets. Rain pounds down on everyone. Floating attack ships shaped like manta rays and whales move slowly through the sky, firing golden laser beams. We see Black Lightning, Vixen, Black Canary, Element Woman, Firestorm, and Zatanna fighting in the thick of it in a glorious two-page spread. Most of those two pages is humans fighting Atlanteans, but there are some of the trench in the shot as well. Orm actually plucks one of them out of it and uses his staff to electrocute the creature. My brother must have figured out how to control the creatures. But I won't let them stop our plan. Nothing can stop them. Ugh! And suddenly a dagger stabs into his arm. The savage Hawkman is on him, roaring like a barbarian caught in a rage. Orm, however, uses the pain to focus. He dodges Hawkman's clumsy flail attack, allowing him to dive into a horde of the trench. Then he pulls out the dagger. <clears throat> My brother's forces are ill-trained, unfocused, and disorganized. And he's right. We see Firestorm turn seawater into steam, but doing so blinds and chokes Zatanna and Black Canary. They're fighting back, sure, but they aren't really doing all that much. A soldier reports to King Orm that the E-devices are in position and ready to go. They're just waiting for his signal. Orm tells his forces, Prepare for submergence. Once the earth cracks and swallows Boston, I'll command the oceans to sweep what remains away. On my command. A boom tube opens on the battlefield and out races the Justice League. King Orm pauses, honestly surprised and more than a little bit frustrated. Arthur. As they go to work, the rookie forces pause in their fighting, amazed at what they're seeing. Where they were fighting messily, the League is precision, teamwork, excellence. 
Even Mera seems to fit in naturally, using her control of water to push back forces both Atlantean and Trench. She clears away, and Aquaman charges at his brother. He leaps in the air, bringing his trident down with an overhead swing like an axe, and the impact against Orm's scepter shakes the very air. For a moment, there's no words between them. Author Jeff Johns uses that moment to have Cyborg spot the bombs and report them to Batman. He tells Cyborg to deactivate them, and then have the reserve members go to him. Elsewhere, Arthur and Orm are exchanging blows and dodging weapons. Congratulations on escaping the dark waters, even taking control of the trench. A part of me is even thankful to see you alive. But I am the king of Atlantis, and I have a duty to fulfill. I must defend it from its enemies, even if they include you. Arthur says that it doesn't have to be that way. Volko engineered this conflict. He is the true threat. And Orm can barely believe it. Your royal servant? Lies. Batman, meanwhile, greets the Reserve League. He needs them to find a man named Volko. Hawkman has one question. You want him dead or alive? Arthur shoves Orm through a bus. If they can work together, combine their forces, they can push the trench back and find Volko, he argues. They can still end this here. No more people have to die, Orm. Tell the Atlanteans to stand down. Orm cuts him off. Stop treating me like a fool! His scepter crackles with electricity, and he sends the charge through the knee-deep water. Arthur cries out in pain. Above the fight, the dead king's scepter held in his hands is Volko. He watches the conflict below, waiting. Come on, Arthur, he says. What are you waiting for? Even if Volko really did all of this, it just confirms how poisonous the surface world really is, Orm argues. Being up here, breathing this tainted air, has corrupted his mind, as surely as it's corrupted yours, Arthur. He hits him with another bolt of electricity. All I have wanted my whole life was to save you, Arthur. When I was a child, I was told horrible stories about the terror that the air breathers have visited upon us. And when I learned I had a brother trapped up there, I wept. Orm grabs Arthur and throws him through a building. For years, I begged the Atlantean guard to go up there and save you, to bring you home. But they refused. That's why I took the throne to begin with, to bring you home. But you found Atlantis. You came home, and I wept that day again, because I love you like a brother should. Orm touches the surface of the water with his scepter again, and another blast of electricity races through Arthur. If your loyalty lies with the surface, if you choose this world over your own, then you've betrayed us all, brother. Me, Mother, Atlantis. On my command, detonate. But the E devices don't detonate. One of the Atlantean soldiers reports that something is wrong. It, it isn't working. But we can see Mera and Cyborg still working their way to the bomb. They aren't the ones who stopped it. A small female figure dressed in a blue and red costume hops away, saying quietly, you're welcome. Cyborg calls Wonder Woman to see to the other bomb, but she and Superman have already got it in the air. Together, they hurl it up into the sky, where it explodes harmlessly. Down below, Orm rages. No! I'll drown this city with my crown! It starts to hum, and just off the coast, a massive tsunami rises into the air. I will show your world that Atlantis is not afraid. But Mera reaches out, and using her hydrokinesis, she stops the wave in mid-motion. Orm concentrates, sneering. That convict can't hold up the water forever. Arthur smiles. She won't have to. The other heroes are working on it. Zaytana casts spells, Firestorm converts water to steam, and Cyborg freezes it. Together, the superheroes stop the wave. Arthur, meanwhile, picks up a bus. 
I was as happy as you to discover I had a brother, he said, to feel like I wasn't alone. He tosses the bus onto Orm. But I am alone, Arthur adds, because that's the life of a true leader. Orm slices the bus with his scepter, leaving himself open. Aquaman rushes in, wielding a wicked left cross. That is why I never wanted the crown! When he punches Orm in the face, his helmet shatters. Panting, Arthur stands over Orm. But I have to take it. So yield. Yield the throne! Orm is reeling. His scepter has fallen from his hand. His helmet is broken in two. With blood running down his nose, he looks at Arthur. He looks at his brother with pain in his eyes. I yield, brother. Up on a rooftop, Batman and the reserves find Volko. Down below, the Atlantean army draws on Aquaman. One of them shouts, King Orm has fallen! Kill Aquaman! So Arthur turns, eyes raging. You dare attack me even now? Orm has yielded! Arthur swings his trident, dashing a number of the trench with it. Then he steps up on a piece of debris and shouts to the sky, I am your king! The army stops fighting, and they kneel. Volko quietly holds out the scepter to Batman with his other hand held up, empty. He simply says, I surrender. Arthur shouts, We cannot fight two wars, Atlanteans, but we don't need to. The surface world is not a threat. They will stand with us against the trench. So stand with me and send these things back to hell. The Justice League and their reserves join with the Atlantean army and they charge at the creatures from the trench. That massive wave that they froze earlier, it cracks and opens and a fresh wave of the trench scrabbles out. The Alpha among them springs at Arthur, but Orm stabs it from behind. Arthur is confused at first, but Orm shakes the thing off his scepter. You're my king now too, brother. Superman asks if Arthur's telepathy can affect these things, but he explains no. He tried once before, but he just can't. They need the dead king's scepter, but to find it, they need to find Volko. Batman then presents Volko, who kneels on the ground before Arthur. He holds out the scepter, and kinda sort of apologizes for all of this. He's sorry, but he had to do it. He did it for Atlantis, for Arthur. The only way for the nation to find its lost glory is his leadership. This was the only way that he could think of that Arthur would take the throne again. Arthur grabs the scepter angrily. That's why you did all of this? So that I'd take back the throne? Do you realize how many people have died because of you? How could you betray me like this? He punches Volko, launching the man through the air and into a pile of the trench. Because, Volko says, bleeding from the nose and mouth, I love Atlantis. I love you like a son. The trench begin to close in on Volko, but Arthur holds out the scepter. Combined with his telepathy, he connects to the trench and orders them to go home. There isn't even a moment of hesitation. They scramble back into the ocean and dive. Arthur, I'm sorry, King Arthur, tells some Atlanteans to arrest Volko. He is the one who attacked Atlantis, so he's the one who needs to answer for that crime. One of them nods. Yes, my king. But what of King Orm... I mean... Orm. Arthur says... He stays here. Off panel, we hear Orm go... What? Why? Behind Orm stands Superman and Wonder Woman, just kind of hanging around him, just in case. You're under arrest, Arthur says. And Orm looks honestly surprised and hurt by this. I, I yielded the throne, brother, he says, grabbing Arthur by the shoulders. I yielded! Because Orm yielded, because he is no longer a foreign leader, 
There is no legal protection for him from his crimes committed here, Arthur says sadly. He has to face justice. Crimes? I was protecting our people! Please, brother, do not condemn me to the surface. You can't be that cruel! Looking away, a shadow passes over Arthur's face. I'm sorry, Orm. I truly am. We cut to Bell Reeve Prison, where we last saw Black Manta. Orm has been stripped of his armor and regalia, leaving him just another dude in an orange jumpsuit. A running news broadcast informs us that the cleanup following the attacks on Gotham, Metropolis, and Boston proceeds apace. The terrorist behind this attack, the Ocean Master, has been locked up. Hello? Orm asks. Are you still there? I'm thirsty again, and I want to talk to my brother. Please? Please let me talk to him? Quietly, he folds over. I don't belong here. At Amnesty Bay, Arthur is rifling through an old chest. He doesn't belong in Atlantis, but he... He has to go, he tells Mara. She reminds him that the last time he was on the throne, Atlantis tried to kill him. What else can I do? If I don't take the throne, what does Atlantis do next? Storm the beaches again to rescue Orm, my brother, who is confused and scared, and Mara cuts him off. And he is totally unremorseful for the people that he killed, Arthur. Don't make him into a martyr like the rest of Atlantis will. And don't make yourself into one, too. Please, she asks. Don't go. Arthur has to. He has been trying to push these two worlds apart since he was a kid. He needs to find a way to bring them together. Then he asks her to come with him. Come with me to Atlantis. Mara can't. He knows that she can't. There's a quiet moment of understanding between them. Arthur pulls a conch shell from the chest, holding it almost reverently. We then cut to Dr. Shin's home, where the news reporters have found him again. Does he know what happens next for Atlantis, they ask. Will they attack again? How long did you know about them? People called you crazy, one asks. Do you feel vindicated? Dr. Shin slowly closes his front door on them and quietly answers, no. Mara and Aquadog watch Arthur leave Amnesty Bay. He has the conch, his trident, the dead king's scepter. He looks out over the ocean and then dives in. Elsewhere, we see Amanda Waller tell Colonel Steve Trevor that this attack by Atlantis was the push that they needed. The world is as skeptical of the League as they're going to be. They need another one. In the Watchtower, Batman has a similar talk with Superman, Wonder Woman, and Cyborg. They need to open their ranks. And somewhere else entirely, a third party says that the opportunity is now. It's time to start recruiting, starting with the Scarecrow. <sighs> so, like, I don't know what I can add to, uh, to, to that. Just in, in general, like, is this story arc perfect? Like, does every element of this work? Because I kind of think that it might. If you couldn't guess by now, our opening pages for this issue are directed towards recapping the story and the latest developments in it. Atlantis plans to flood Boston, Volko's relationship to Arthur is explained, as is his role in the story, and then we have the emotional stakes presented, with Arthur claiming responsibility for this entire mess. But we also have a number of smaller things that I want to take a little bit of time to point out. First off, that opening scene at the lighthouse. It definitely helps to set a mood, that a storm is hitting and no one can stop it. You can just survive it. But author Jeff Johns is also establishing just a little bit of how Arthur views Atlantis in that scene, too. 
we've seen Arthur try to talk the Justice League down from war multiple times in this story arc. It has seemed like the easiest and most sensible way to save as many lives as possible. Just don't fight. But this moment at the beginning, where Arthur thinks about his dad, kind of demonstrates otherwise. Tom was afraid that this storm heralded the Atlanteans coming to take Arthur away. That's two of a child's greatest fears, the sheer raw physical presence of a storm, this unstoppable force of nature, and being stolen in the night by monsters, wrapped into one terrible night. Atlanteans and the power that they wield aren't just a physical threat to Arthur. They're a childhood trauma, one part boogeyman, one part threat to him. Yes, as an adult, he has lived among them and he has gotten to know them, but a lot of that interaction seems to have just cemented that fear. He knows how isolationist the Atlanteans can be. He knows how violent they can be. He knows the technology at their command. Arthur knows that without the League working to stop Atlantis, there is nothing that would stop them from sinking Boston. That is how dangerous they are. And I would argue that Johns has established how dangerous they are in really practical plot terms, but this moment is really the first look into Arthur's head regarding them. Thinking about it, this might actually be the first time that Arthur narrates in this comic at all, save for when he is talking to other characters. You'll often see Johns do a writing trick where a character will say something, and then you'll move to the next panel, and they'll finish saying that thing in a little dialogue narration box, but the scene will be beginning to move on. Sometimes he does this as a transition. Sometimes he does this as kind of a forced transition, where maybe the dialogue has nothing to do with the next scene, but because you're moving with it, you get it just feels more natural. But that might be the first time he narrates. Wow, I'm, I'm not going to go back and look at every issue, but that's kind of remarkable for a book to have reached 17 issues, and suddenly this issue is the one where you drop narration on us. Anyways, this connects the threat of Atlantis to Arthur personally, allowing us to understand his actions better. Given how much difficulty Johns had connecting Arthur's past with his present in the Others story arc, that is a great improvement from a writing perspective. We also get a tiny bit of new story regarding Mera. It's just a smidge, but a little bit. She comments that Volko might want revenge for being exiled, although she might be projecting her words. She's saying that her people have been exiled from Atlantis as well, which is new information at this point in the story. Again, unless you've been reading the pre-New 52 stuff, in which case you might know a little bit about Mera. But again, this is the New 52. That continuity is not supposed to matter. Mm, no 52 shenanigans. We then move on to the fight within the comic itself, which keeps everything moving pretty much as it should. Like, everything follows its next natural step in the story, right? The League reserves have basically been a stalling action. Too disorganized to actually stop Atlantis, but dangerous enough to slow them down. We get to see this. The Atlantean bombs have been planted, but they have not detonated yet. They are ready to blow Boston to the bottom of the ocean, though. And that's when the League shows up, baby. I love this moment. And I will add that part of the reason that I like it so much is because I have been reading Justice League 2011. Johns has been building up a demand from the government over in that comic, from the people of the world, really, for the Justice League to do more, to expand, to be better. And I won't go into all of those story elements here, but it's kind of nice to see the League show up and have everybody just shut the floop up and respect. They work together effectively, they trust each other, and they kick so much butt. Seeing powerful and experienced characters like Vixen, Black Canary, and Firestorm just stop in awe and watch tells us all we need to know about how impressive of a moment this is. And even if you aren't somebody who knows the history of characters like Vixen, Black Canary, and Firestorm, you've been watching them struggle against Atlantis in these comics. You've seen them fighting. You know that they're effective, but not great. But they're still the people who stop and go, whoa, that's the flooping Justice League. That's fucking Batman. Look at him go. And it works. And look at that. You know, the second the League drops in, the whole tide of the battle changes. 
Batman, who is the league's chairman and team leader, takes charge of the reserves and almost immediately finds Volko. And to be fair, it's not like Volko was hiding. He was just standing on the edge of a roof. All you have to do is go, that's a guy on a roof. And then someone goes and looks at it and you found Volko. But still, that's one guy out of a whole city. So nice job. Uh, And then the rest of the league juggles Atlantean forces and the trench, which leaves Aquaman free to handle his brother. And what an exchange! We haven't seen a lot of Arthur and Orm getting to be brothers in this story, right? It's mostly them as kings, with responsibilities greater than their personal relationship. But Orm's speech about how much that he loved the idea of Arthur and how far he was willing to go to get him. Like, keep in mind, Orm was younger than Arthur was when he would have learned of his existence, and he was still, like, excited for him and nervous for him. He wanted his brother, and he wanted him safe, and with him... Like, wow! The pain at being betrayed, the pathos uh, of losing a sibling, just all of this... I asked one of my best friends, Ephraim, to come in and record Orm's lines with me because I just felt like that moment between the two of them needed some respect put on it. And me reading both halves of them just wouldn't really get the effect across to y'all. I was, as I was writing it, I was like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta act out both halves of this? Like, that's weird. And I thought about maybe throwing a weird vocal distortion on to, like, do something with Orm's voice. Uh, And sometimes that's fun, but I really feel like it would just sound artificial and fake. And it would sound like me putting on a a vocal thing. I guess I could have given Orm like a a dopey accent or something like that. But it was much more fun for me to bring in one of my best friends and get to act with him in this little bit of scene. Uh, So thank you, Ephraim, for coming in and helping out with that. I super appreciate it. As always, I love you, man. Uh, And I hope you all liked it. If you did, please let me know. Um, I'm kind of always looking for a a good excuse to pull Ephraim in on a project I'm working on. It's just a matter of lining up our schedules and finding something that fits naturally. Uh, and this was just a blast for me. So thank you again. Um, do you want to say a, like, hello or a thank you or anything on the podcast? Like, is there anything you want to say to the audience at all? Or do you feel, do you want to be a mystery man? Hey, how's it going guys? This is Ephraim. Just uh, want to give a shout out to my boy, one of my best friends, my brother, Ben, for giving me this opportunity to record. Like always, I have a bunch of fun doing it, and he knows that I really get into the character once I get a couple of takes. And we just have an absolute blast in doing this. And at the end of the day, it just seems like we tend to get on the same page. And we basically end up turning gold i guess you can say (laughs) from our standards anyway but uh anyhow um just hope you guys enjoy this and keep listening and thank him again and hope you have fun listening see you guys peace thanks for jumping in there right at the end (laughs) conard that'll be wonderful uh and in response to orm's personal pain we have arthur rallying, beating Orm, and taking the Goram throne. And not because he wants it either, but because it is the only way to really end this conflict left to him. Again, this is a six-issue story arc. This isn't a conflict that you wrap up in six issues, unless one of your lead heroes happens to be in the perfect position to take over responsibility for the attacking nation. Atlantis needs to be pacified. And Orm was never going to be the man to do it. So Arthur will. The thing I love most about this stuff with Arthur and Orm, honestly, is uh, Orm's horror at being arrested. Because it feels real in that moment. He was expecting to come up here, chew bubblegum, kick ass, and just none of it worked. Humans, those weak air-breathing apes beat the forces of Atlantis. And like, on one level, that's gotta be like enough pain, right? To just be beaten. And from Orm's perspective, the initial worst case scenario to this conflict was, you know what? Maybe he gets beaten. Maybe he retreats back to the ocean and everything in Atlantis goes back to normal, right? Worst case scenario, humans aren't gonna follow you down there. But this isn't the 13th century anymore. 
You can't just invade a nation, say, oops, you win, and then retreat back into your territory easy peasy. Orm launched this war, and maybe for the best of reasons. He wanted to defend his people. He wanted retribution for what they had lost. He wanted a show of force to ensure that this kind of attack wasn't going to happen again. If you think, reading this and listening to this, that that makes him a villain, then you may have been too young to experience America's response to the terror attacks of 9-11. Because we were attacked from out of nowhere by terrorist forces, and then we spent 20 years fighting back. It didn't work very well, unfortunately, although it did keep us safe to some degree. But if you think Orm's the bad guy, then so is America. And maybe America was. Maybe this whole thing is some kind of weird fantasy Atlantean allegory for the war in the Middle East. I don't really think that's what Johns is going for. I would honestly say I'm probably reading into it, but I am trying to convey to y'all that Jeff Johns absolutely did not want Orm to be just a supervillain in this story arc. In researching this particular story arc, I have seen so many interviews with Jeff Johns where he's like, Orm is not a supervillain. He is not a guy in a silly costume with superpowers who shows up and gets beaten and goes to a prison because in the same way that normal supervillains do. He is the leader of a sovereign nation. He is a king. He has responsibilities and those motivate him in a way that yes, America and the Justice League disagree with, but he is not a supervillain, and that's because he's not. These actions under different light look completely different. <sighs> but for me, they are really hitting home, personally. So Orm is arrested, and the pain on his face in that moment, the betrayal of knowing that his brother is the one who could Choose not to do this. Arthur could just go, nah, he's coming with me back to Atlantis. But Arthur does it anyway. Because it's the right thing to do. And it leaves Arthur utterly alone. His mother and father are dead. He called Volko the closest thing to family that he had left, and that's gone. Orm was his actual brother by blood, and he's going to go to jail. Arthur's duty to Atlantis is probably going to largely keep him from the Justice League... And from Mara, who can't go with him, Arthur sacrificed everything that gave him comfort in order to do the right thing. And that is super heroic. That is true valor. There are a variety of endings to this issue, most of which set up other things in the New 52 and not Aquaman things. After this crossover, the Justice League does indeed invite some new members to the team, and it's actually a pretty fun issue getting to watch a bunch of weird characters bounce off the Justice League, including a traitor. Never a good move, but always an interesting plot development. I uh, will give Jeff Johns credit for that. Waller's scene actually picks up on another Justice League plot thread that the U.S. government has been wanting to either... Uh, influence the League, let's say, or have its own Justice League. And this will lead to the launching of a new ongoing series called The Justice League of America. If you had been reading these comics with me, then you would have been seeing ads for that particular book and all of the spinoffs that spin out of it, because there's like four uh, this entire time. I'm actually kind of amazed how much DC was hyping up the launch of Justice League of America during the throne of Atlantis crossover like they were definitely going well if you like Aquaman and you like Justice League you're probably gonna like these other com these other six comic books and it's like it's like six books man like they were really going for it the mysterious third figure who is looking to recruit bad guys is a simmering plot line that will run through all of the Justice League books actually in the background uh, I think for a couple of years before finally culminating in the forever evil crossover event so if you're interested in any of that stuff, there you go. You can go read that. But we're here for Aquaman. What about Aquaman? We know what he's given up, but we don't know what he's swimming into yet. That's kind of the cool thing, though, isn't it? A lot of crossovers, I would argue, especially a lot of them nowadays, feel like they are all noise and flash, meant to draw in attention and money without actually affecting the status quo of the comics involved all that much. But here, tons of stuff has changed in Aquaman's corner of the world. 
the human world now knows and fears Atlantis. And probably Aquaman, who has gone from a joke to, uh... I mean, to what? Like a threat, I suppose? That's a, a complete 180 on the public perception front. The Justice League expands. A new league is formed. Arthur and Mera. The only constant that we've had in this book so far, that pair has now been separated. With Arthur going to Atlantis, we're going to have a whole new cast, uh, a new set of threats, and probably see Arthur in a way that we have not gotten to see him fully be in this entire run yet. We get to see him as a king, baby. Before I wrap up, I also want to note how melancholy this entire issue is. When the other's story arc closed out, that story felt, it felt big and epic. It felt like a summer blockbuster, right? All of these characters running around in kind of a big scale, like Black Manta had a weapon that could sink islands. That's a thing, right? And this story certainly had scope and scale, but God, is this a bummer ending. It kind of makes me think of like a Spider-Man story in my mind, which I'm much more familiar with compared to Aquaman, where... The hero did the right thing, but it cost him so much that it just doesn't feel good to do the right thing. This is also the most super heroic tone that the Aquaman comic has had this entire run, I would argue. I've mentioned this before that Arthur really feels more like an adventurer in a lot of our previous issues, but definitely not this particular story. This was big time super heroics and costumes. It was really tightly paced. I was a little worried going into this arc because it is partially Justice League and partially Aquaman. It's six issues total plus an epilogue, which we'll get to next episode. And I was like, that's a lot of crossover. Like, I don't think Johns can pace this out really well. But honestly, there's not a point where the story drags. Everything keeps moving pretty fast paced at a nice, nice, even keel. Uh, It builds really well. Everything wraps up really nicely. The only thing I think we maybe didn't get an explanation for, I mean, I know we didn't get an explanation for it as of yet, is uh, what the deal with that dead Atlantean who washed up on Volko's doorstep was. Uh, We still have no idea what's going on there. I don't know if that's something Johns is going to resolve or not. He has certainly left other ideas simmering in the background or forgotten about. Take your pick. There are, I mean, I suppose if I were going to complain about anything, there are some coloring problems in this issue. Towards the end of the issue, the colors just look um, half-finished. In the world of coloring comic books, there's a term called flatting, which is when a digital colorist will take the finished inks and they will put in, like, all the basic colors. Sky blue, Aquaman shirt, orange gloves, green, hair, blonde, skin, peach... And it gives you the basic idea. And then when they have more time, they go back through and they add in highlights like this lovely streak here or shadows um, in order to give the characters and the scenery greater depth and pop and meaning. And it does feel like there's a couple two page spreads towards the end of this issue that just don't get that attention to detail, uh, which I, I personally still have a hard time complaining about, because if you count the three issues of Justice League that Ivan Reese and the rest of the art team drew, plus the 14 issues of Aquaman that they drew before this, I think Ivan Reese drew something like 17 to 18 issues of comic books straight through, never being late, all of them looking gorgeous. And my, some of these two page spreads, folks, if you are a podcast listener at Hey, thank you for listening to the podcast. But if you are a podcast listener and you're not watching on YouTube and you didn't get to see Ivan Reese's two page spreads of like when Orm was shocking the Justice League or when the Atlantean army rose up from the depths uh, or in this final issue during some of these battle scenes, they are so detailed. Like this is one of those things where I'm like, I have no understanding. There's no understanding in my head how the art team got these issues out on time. It boggles my imagination. Um, I'll fully admit I did not double check publication dates to see if these books were late and maybe I just forgot about it because that's entirely possible. Uh, But to the best of my knowledge, these books came out on time and it's just impressive as heck. It's just super great. Like, (sighs) overall, this story rocked. Uh, This was solid. Claremontian even uh, in its ability to juggle both scope, 
personal issues, drama, and action. I kind of, sort of, actively loved this. I am exhausted by it, but I definitely loved this. Next week, Aquaman has returned to the oceans as the king of Atlantis. But it isn't all seashell bikinis and delicious oysters. We begin to navigate new waters in episode 26.15 of Comic Book Breakdown, Aquaman. Who are you fighting for? If you enjoyed this episode of Breakdown, please make sure to hit that like button. And if you are not subscribed to the show, then click on that as well. I love getting feedback and I would really appreciate it if you did so. If you have any questions, concerns, or would like to suggest a comic or a series to me, Breakdown can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and on a variety of podcast platforms with links in the description for this episode below, as well as the email cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Thank you for your time and attention.